All right, guys. So we're going to be shortly joined with Patrick Liu, GM of Rovio out in Stockholm, Sweden. We're just uh, waiting a few minutes till he joins. Thanks for jumping in. I see a few people coming in. I tweeted the link, dropped it on Reddit. Welcome. Welcome, um, everyone. We, oh, it looks like Patrick's joined in. Hello, Patrick. Hello. Hey, Patrick. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? Long time no see. Yeah. Long time. <laughs> what time is it there? It is 9 o'clock in the morning. Wow. I usually don't start work until 10 or 10.30, so we got up extra early just for you. <laughs> <laughs> How's everything in Stockholm? Good, good. It's, uh, you know, just had midsummer. Everything is very bright. Uh, there are no nights here right now, which is kind of strange. Oh, God. How do you sleep? You just have to uh, draw the blinds. <laughs> <laughs> um, cool. So, hey, thanks for taking the time to join us. Um, we're really excited to have you, and uh, we do have a few people that are, are watching and, and might be posting some questions that we'll get to in a little bit. But, um, yeah, we just wanted to, to first off thank you for joining us, and I know uh, people who do follow us are really excited to have you on board. So, um with that being said, I guess we'll just we'll jump right in and and to start, um, I know you're a big Star Wars guy like me. I got my my Darth Vader surfing T-shirt on. Um, so tell everyone, dark side or light side, and why? Uh, light side for sure. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's because Yoda, Yoda is my guru. I I trust in Yoda, and so I have to be on the light side. That's a great answer. Everyone trusts in Yoda, I think, right? So, yeah. Um, if you can talk to the talk to us and to everyone watching a little bit about your role uh, with Rovio in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, Rovio is is uh, a Finnish company from the beginning, but we are uh, a wholly owned uh, subsidiary uh, of that Finnish mothership. Uh, we founded. I was part of founding the the, the whole uh, studio in Stockholm. Back in 2012, um, back then I was a uh, creative director, and we shipped actually a, a few games uh, in soft launch that we killed uh, eventually. But the biggest one they actually launched globally that was made here was uh, Angry Birds 2, um, and still uh, live and well and growing. Uh, it's a fantastic title. I'd say I'm very proud of it. Um, nowadays, I am uh, general manager of the studio, um, so yeah, like actually a little bit less connected to to the to the product, but still uh, very much involved on, on, on pretty much every level. Um, so you mentioned 2012. Uh, you mentioned that's when you came over to Rovio, and, and previous to that, you were with EA, which is where you and I first met. Um, and you were working on Battlefield. Uh, you'd been with the franchise for a little while. So, what um, drew you to make that that switch uh, in 2012 from you know a, a, a big publisher and a big title like Battlefield to move over to the digital side and, and join Rovio? Yeah, good question. I mean, I have. Uh, I mean, I always follow kind of my own passion, my interests, and um, you know, I, I I found out. That uh, I, I kind of spent a whole lot of time on my phone, playing game, uh, my iPhone, uh, and Androids for that matter, uh, and I kind of wanted to, to see what what what's new there. And and uh, you know, obviously it felt very cutting edge. It, it is still like kind of the forefront of the development of the industry, I think, uh, in many ways. Um, and so then Rovio was kind of announcing that they wanted to start a new studio in Stockholm, they had a bag of money, and I kind of jumped onto that opportunity to, to build a new studio from scratch. That's kind of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that you can't say no to. Mm. Um, you mentioned Angry Birds 2 as well, which is the, the first released project from your studio. Um, you've also been there uh, for the release of quite a few Angry Birds games uh, from the mothership, as you called it, uh, as well as a movie, a bunch of merchandise. Um, what has been the favorite thing for you to be a part of thus far? Because there's been a lot happening in the past four years. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of really awesome things. I, I really love the whole thing we did with Angry Birds Star Wars, you know, and the kind of how to toy to game thing we did. You can scan your toys into the mobile and, and kind of add that character to the game. That was 
That was a while back. Uh, that was before. Uh, well, maybe it was just the beginning of of the uh, Skylanders. Um, but we we did that thing with Star Wars. That was cool. Um, I also got the opportunity to kind of visit the the Hasbro headquarters to kind of check out their stuff uh, on on Transformers. That was cool. Um, and then obviously the whole movie thing. I this was the first time that I kind of got to follow the development of a kind of big blockbuster animated movie from the inside, and I saw a lot of previews before the movie was done, just, you know, with storyboarding and stuff like that. Um, really awesome to follow that journey, and now obviously the, the movie's doing great, so that's, we're really happy about that too. So, yeah, lots of lots of cool stuff that happened throughout the years. Did they ask you to do any voiceovers? <laughs> no, um, no. I, they, I, I think they wanted pros on that, but I, <laughs> I, I am in the credits. It's the first movie I, 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 I'm in the credits. Are you really? Yeah. Did you get to? Get, are you gonna get a copy and just keep it sealed forever? <laughs> yeah, when, whenever it comes out, I'll probably get one. Yeah. The, the first game I worked on, Need for Speed. Um, I have I kept an Xbox and a PlayStation copy in its wrapping <laughs> in my closet, so when I have kids eventually, I can open it and prove to them that I was actually a part of something, right? Because you got to have yeah. that that name and credit proof. So. Exactly. Um. Uh, I mean, we're going to get back to Angry Birds in a second, but I, I wanted to ask you a few questions about um, the mobile industry in general. So um, you guys are a massive part of it. Uh, since the first release of Angry Birds, um, you have you know led the way in, in what has become the mobile gaming platform thus far, in my opinion. So um, my first question is, you know, this year the industry is going to account for about $29 billion, and it's expected in the next two years um, to hit around 50, so uh, nearly a double in in, uh, in revenue from the industry. So, in your opinion, what do you think is causing this recent mass explosion in, in the revenue in the mobile gaming market? Um, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's a mass explosion. I mean, for me, that's now that I've worked with, with it for a while, it, it, it's been growing steadily for, for quite some time, actually. Um, and now it's kind of yeah, going uh, you know, into that extreme growth uh, and I think it's, it's like because of the growth of the device for example like everyone has a, has a smartphone now um, and, and uh, people are just moving over to, to more you know, uh, convenient and more available devices that's one thing uh, and the other is obviously the whole thing with free to play games that also kinda lowers the bar to basically nothing to stop playing games um, and there's a lot of people that I know that kind of, when I ask them, like, do you play games? And they're like, no, I don't play games, but um, I do play Angry Birds or Candy Crush or whatever. And it's like, yeah, well, then you are actually playing games. And, and, <laughs> and just looking at data, I know for a fact, a lot of people that say they just play casually, they spend, like, hours per day on, on Candy Crush, for example. Uh, but they just don't know about it themselves. Um, so I think it's definitely the availability and kind of the, the, the bar to, to for entry is so low, and that's kind of causing the, the growth in the whole industry. And based on that, do you think that over time um, the mobile industry will eclipse console and PC gaming, mm -hmm. like from user base and revenue? Because, you know, for me, um, I'm still a console gamer, and I still play my console all the time, but mm -hmm. I'm definitely playing my mobile much more just because... It's crazy. Like you're watching TV, you pull out your phone, you start playing a game, or you're on the bus or whatever, and you start playing. So um, I think we're already starting to see that trend. But do you see a day where it uh, like totally eclipses, you know, PC and console gaming? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think I, I don't have the numbers now, so I'm just winging it. <laughs> but uh, I think the number of users is probably already eclipsed. I mean, just you know. If you look at just consoles, say suppose they, they sell 100 million units per console, and we have three kind of big major players, there are 300 million devices, uh, and, and you know we have probably 2 billion tablets and mobile phones. So the whole kind of, the, the, the market is way bigger in terms of users. Um, but revenue, we probably have some ways to go still, but I, I still think that, you know, kind of looking at the behavior of, of, of consumers in general, we kind of moving more towards kind of short bursts of, of entertainment or, or satisfaction. Um, you know, 
looking at at uh, you know how how more people spend more time with TV series rather than movies now instead because they are shorter bursts of, of entertainment. Um, but I mean, you know, the console and PC industry will always be there. I think uh, you know even even arcades they're kind of niche now, but still they're still around. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think it's the same thing with with with, with PC and console. They're gonna you know stick around for for, for a whole lot longer. Um. So yeah, you talked about some of the numbers with users and, and um, with revenue coming from mobile games, and I wanted to talk about two markets specifically, which are China and Japan. So um, in, in 2015, those were the two biggest markets from a revenue perspective when it came to the mobile gaming platform. I'm, I mean, the technology there, uh, you know, compared to us here in North America is leaps and bounds uh, further ahead, but... Um, Based on the markets being that massive, um, I think together they accounted for nearly 50% of the total revenue from mobile gaming. Do you guys factor that in when you're building games? Do you factor in localization and who's going to be playing the game the most? Or do you create a game that you, you focus on the user experience for everyone and just know that it's going to be played wherever it gets released? Um, we we absolutely think about it a lot, um, and and you know just yeah the, those markets that you mentioned are just crazy, right? And and you know, China and, and Japan and, and South Korea are just insane. Like they have they have billion dollar games that we have never heard about. Uh, and you know just uh, one great example is Puzzle and Dragons, which is kind of known in the West, but it's just huge in Japan, right? Uh, the, the 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 challenge is that uh, we have so different tastes. If you just look an ad, like an ad for any game, you know how how busy it is in a Japanese ad and how clean it is, uh, relatively in, in Western ads. Uh, that that kind of tells the whole story of our different tastes. So, we actually did did a very concrete thing with Angry Birds too. We we uh, made a separate uh, Chinese version of the game, which mm. actually looks a little bit different and has slightly different feature sets that kind of appeals the Chinese market more, so there are essentially two different versions of the same game, uh, and, and one of them then being specialized in the user experience that's tailor-made for the Chinese audience, so it's something we definitely think about a lot. How did they, how did they respond to that? Did you notice that um, it was downloaded more than previous Angry Birds games based on the localization, or was it you know, pretty in line with games that you had released previously? Um, no, I mean it, it's it's absolutely by far the best performing Angry Birds mm -hmm. game we've seen so far in, in China. Uh, it had a, a very good penetration. It's, I can I think it also kind of paved the way for the movie in a sense, just kind of strengthening the brand in the, in the country. Do you think that's something that um, not just you guys but other developers as well will look at and say, you know, maybe we should start making more localized versions of games? I know it's a lot of work. Uh, to make what you said were like minor adjustments, but um, it's a lot of work to do that on the back end. So is it something that you guys uh, are now considering, and do you think it's for the future of the industry would make more sense to make versions, um, you know, localized for certain markets? Yeah, I mean, if, if you have the resources and time to do it, uh, I would definitely go for it. So the, the, the one challenge that we had for Angry Birds 2 was actually we seam launched the two versions. So we kind of had to <laughs> work with the Chinese version alongside the, the Western version and mm. what it was done, obviously. And uh, that was a huge challenge. Uh, and, and the thing also with, with China is that you have to work with a Chinese partner. You can't release games by your own there. Uh, and, and, you know, Android as a platform is, is the dominating platform. And, and the challenge there is actually kind of payment systems because they don't typically use Google Play as the app store, they they have like, you know, ten or twenty different app stores, and you have to be on all of them. You have to work with someone there. So that that's kind of another challenge that you don't really consider uh, if you're not kind of really digging into it. Mm -hmm. So um, before we jump into Angry Birds specifically, um, we have uh, quite a few people uh, watching now and that follow us that are developers themselves, um, and so uh, you know. With the, the boom of the mobile industry, I think it's allowed 
you know, for increased creativity and and for content creators and developers uh, to to have that um, you know one-on-one -on -one user experience like never before. Um, you know, prior to the boom, if you wanted to work in gaming, you know, you'd, you'd go work for a publisher. It was nearly impossible to release an indie game yourself. Um, whereas now. Uh, there are so many tools out there uh, that give you the abilities to do it, you know, at home on your computer, build a game, and have it released to the App Store shortly. So, um, based on that, if you had any, you know, uh, words of wisdom for up-and-coming developers, um, what would they be? How would if a developer wanted to come work for you guys at Rovio and they're just starting out? Um, what kind of advice would you give them? Oh wow, <laughs> that's a big <laughs> question. Um, I think, I mean. Uh, as you say, the, the hurdle to start making games is lower than ever before. You know, we have all these great tools. Angry Birds 2 is built on Unity, and, and that's a tool that kind of anyone can get into quite easily. Um, so, so making the game is quite easy. Publishing your game on App Store is also quite easy. Um, and I think just getting a, a job in the industry, um, that that's really cool just to... to to make your own stuff. So what we look at when we hire people uh, is basically your portfolio and what, what kind of games you manage to make uh, on your own um, and really finish something uh, and rather than having something half-baked. But another, another thing on, on that topic is because I, 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 I go out and give a lot of lectures in, in at universities and stuff and actually had a recent um, lecture with the title was, I think, you know, uh, you know, think about making mobile games. Uh, think again, because the the thing is, publishing a game is easy, but making a business out of it is extremely hard, right? I think I think there's like, I I, I can't remember the, the number, but I think on the App Store there's like 500 games published every day. Holy cow! And, and it's like, how do you how do you get, you know? Above the noise, how do you get get noticed and, and you know discovered? That that is the big challenge now. So, whatever you do, uh, you know, consider how to get discovered. Whether that's viral stuff or marketing or paid use acquisition, uh, whatever tools you have at hand, uh, you need to work with that to get discovered. I think there's a ton of awesome games out there that we've never heard of before, and that's kind of sad. Yeah, and I think actually it that creates a perfect segue into um, Angry Birds because um, Angry Birds was, if I'm not mistaken, the 52nd game created by Rovio or some version of Rovio. They they changed their name a bit over time, but um, that's a perfect example, right? They had to make you know 51 games, um, which some people heard of, but 51 games before the big one really hit and. Um, I guess that plays into it a bit too, right? Is is testing different things and and trying different versions of games to see what the audience eventually uh, attaches themselves to. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think Angry Birds as a success story was, uh, you know, both that you no, know, they obviously have a very experienced developers that made that game since they made you know over fifty other games before that. So it's not only by chance that happened. They obviously were doing a lot of conscious decisions. But also, of course, you have to have some luck in that. that you, you know, you make the right game at the right time on the right platform. That's also kind of the, the perfect storm. Um, and, 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 you know, I don't think it's easily repeated again, you know, that kind of success. Um, but, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I think a lot of these games and, and companies have, have been doing it for quite some time. You know, as, you know, they're perceived as overnight successes, but most of them actually have done that for for a very long time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. I think a lot of people don't realize the amount of, of work and, and creativity that has to come into releasing a title, and then um, the first one isn't going to become a massive success, so it does take time and tweaking, which um, Rovio, Rovio proves. So um, The first Angry Birds came out in, I think it was 2009, is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, so what keeps it fresh? I mean, there's been 15, I think, iterations of the game, as well as a whole bunch of other stuff. But, I mean, seven years later, um, I remember my wife and I, when we first met, um, I would get frustrated because she was so addicted to the game that we would like to be trying to have a conversation and she was playing Angry Birds. And this was six years ago. So um, how is it still so relevant and fresh after all that time? Um, I mean, I, I, I think there's uh, a couple of things. One is that... 
uh, we've you know, gone into different genres and stuff. You know, we did you know, a karting game and RPG game and, and some other action games. Um, but the core of it is, the, is to have a really strong brand, right? It's, it's a... I don't remember, we, we had some term for it, but basically the, the kind of iconic uh, looks of, of the red bird is, is so recognizable, right? You can, you can you know, be in the jungle and, and ride a boat throughout the river and, and you see spot a t-shirt, uh, you know, a hundred yards away, you'll see that's angry birds. Uh, so it's kind of this iconic design that, that transcends all kinds of media. Um, and th that, that's, I think, is the most important thing to build a really strong brand. And, and they kind of bet everything on expanding it for, for quite some time. Um, but then, you know, we, with Angry Birds 2, we, we figured that we want to go back to basics. Uh, because it's been a few years since that kind of pure slingshot game. Um, and, and arguably, we are kind of the king of slingshot games. Uh, and uh, going back to that was also a really good choice because now, now people had kind of tried all these different uh, types of genres, but they kind of longing back to the old pure slingshot game, and that that wasn't really well for us. So um, now with the movie, we kind of we are seeing it internally as as kind of a reboot as well because you now you the birds can talk, you know, they get legs and arms. Um, kind of a new uh, take on the whole franchise. And, uh, yeah, well, hopefully it will we'll, uh, get a, a new boost for us as well. Yeah, it's crazy how much Angry Birds has actually transcended just being a game. Like, it's, it's, it's probably the first mobile game that's actually become, you know, almost a way of life. Like you said, you see T-shirts everywhere. I mean, you can't go to a mall now without seeing an Angry Birds um, piece of merchandise at some store. And then the movie coming out has really just... Um, caused it to, you know, take it to another level and, and reach a whole new audience, especially a younger audience of kids who uh, maybe are getting their first experience with the game. And I think that's amazing because I think it's something to strive for, um, you know, for developers that are, are coming up. It's it's a, it's obviously a lot of time and a lot of work and resources to get there, but um, I think it's awesome. So uh, the fact that your name is in the credits of that movie is just a bonus, right? So I, th I think that's awesome. Um, I, I think a lot of kids probably will play Angry Birds as their very first game, right? Mm -hmm. That is that is what they will remember in, in 10 or, or 20 years. Like, oh, I remember when I started playing games and, and I play Angry Birds and I, I still remember it and what's this great movie. Uh, you know, you, that's nothing you can really say about the Super Mario Brothers movie. Uh, <laughs> I suppose <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I remember. <laughs> I still watch that from time to time, just because I need a good laugh. Yeah, I haven't yeah. seen it for for, for, for for many years. Oh, they made Koopa a human. It was unbelievable. It was yeah, it was bad. It was bad. <laughs> um, so uh, you, you probably don't remember this, but I do. Ba um, to give people a little bit of a background, back in 2011, we were both working for EA. I was based in Vancouver, and you were in Sweden. Yeah. And we, uh, we, we got to do a South American tour together promoting um, Battlefield and Need for Speed. And I remember we were in an airport. And I don't remember the game you were playing, but you were playing a game. It was on probably iPhone 4 at the time. And uh, you were talking to me about it, and you explained to me that within the game... You could make purchases to um, make your character better or, or go further along. And I apologize for not remembering the game, but that was my first exposure to um, freemium and pay-to-play with paywalls and stuff. And yeah. um, obviously that has become the model uh, for the most success. Uh, it's very rare now that you see games, you know, for 5 or $6 with in-app purchases in them. Um, so... Uh, Angry Birds uses that model for, for Angry Birds 2 specifically, I know uses it fairly well. Um, how do you guys go about um, factoring that into the developmental process? Like, are you guys thinking about that early? Is it something that developers should consider right at the start? Or should you be focused on making um, a really cool, crisp, clean game and then bringing the freemium stuff in after once you've got, you know, the bones of your game built? Uh, that's a really good question. I mean, uh, that I have a very clear answer on that, and that is that you have to consider it from the ground up. Like you have to. I mean, so the, one of the things that we learned the hard way when I, when we started this studio is um, how how kind of 
no, they they really mesh together. The the whole kind of the business side and the game design side, you you, is, you can't get away from that. We tried for a long time, but we, you just can't. You have to build them hand in hand, um, and that's that's a good thing, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and I know you mentioned this uh, thing with paywalls, so. Nowadays, I would I would claim that majority of free-to-play games they don't have any true pay paywalls. Like most games, you can access everything eventually. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Like mostly, it's about spending either time or money, right? So some people are, are are have a lot of time and they can do that. Most of kids, and then adults like us, uh, we have less time but we have more money. Right. So, you know, you you have to invest either or, um, and and really good free to play games. I would say, people talk about them just as good games. They they kind of if they if you're really successful, people don't really talk about them as free to play games. They say, simply say they're good games. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Hearthstone comes to mind, uh, and uh, League of Legends, for example. All these competitive games. They're like, yeah, they're really good games, but no one really you know coins them as free-to-play games in the same sense. No, totally. I, I think that's that's a very fair statement, and, and it makes total sense. I mean, um, I'm waiting for the day when Call of Duty is free-to-play, <laughs> like a, a brand-new Call of Duty on call. I think it's coming. I just think it's a way down the road. But, um, you know, I, I think what mobile gaming has done is really um, forced the big the big publishers to maybe look at revenue models a different way. And it's not just about we're going to release the game and sell it for, you know, 70 or $80 now. It's what are we going to do down the line to continuously bring revenue into this title? Um, and then what can we do to enter the market at a less expensive cost and, and maybe make our revenue down the road from the people who have the money to spend, right? So um, I think you guys have been a big player in, in leading that charge. And uh, I think it's great because at the end of the day, us as gamers get the opportunity to do things uh, at no cost to us. The only cost that it is is your time, and if you want to increase, you you spend the money and you keep going, right? So, um, I think it's great, and uh, I know we do. We had a we had a couple questions from Reddit, and I think we have a couple questions from those that jumped in and, and wanted to ask you some things. So we wanted to make sure we left some time to get to those. So I'm going to pass it over to Rich, who has a few questions for you from. Uh, from those platforms. Yeah, sure. So some of the questions we had from Reddit was uh, pretty much about Angry Birds. Um, you know, first of all, does Rovio plan on creating a new IP anytime soon and really diving in on that, or just focusing on Angry Birds for the near term? Um, we're, we're definitely looking into new brands. Uh, we've made a few attempts, <laughs> to be honest, but <laughs> but 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 uh, arguably they haven't been as successful. Um, and we're working also a lot with being a publisher and, and you know, publishing other indie developers. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we are looking into new brands. It's just uh, very, very hard <laughs> to, to kind of get a, another successful brand like that. So we, we basically we invest both more in Angry Birds and in new, new IPs. And a follow-up will be, um, will Angry Birds have more collaborations with other brands like they did with Star Wars? And can we expect to see some new collaborations? Uh, we don't have anything planned right now. Nothing announced. Uh, but but you never know. You know, if we find a good fit, uh, it, it could happen. Absolutely. And I guess my follow-up question is: Now that you've experienced something like that, where you take a game and you branch out into merchandise, movies, is that sort of a going forward strategy on new games, or is that something you have to wait until you establish that user base? And you know for sure it's a winner. Yeah, I, I think you, you kind of need to build up a strong brand first before you can kind of transcend the different media, um, and and that's probably not going to happen with just one game. You know, we we, we might you know need a series of games in the same franchise, and if that's successful, then that would be the next step to make more stuff out of it. That's all I have. That was cool. great. Oh. Um, Patrick. Thanks again, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, I know it's it's the evening there, and um, you know we're probably keeping you from your dinner, so we don't want to <laughs> take up your whole night. But no, um, for those that are 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 following and and gonna watch on YouTube, um, what's the best way for people to stay connected with you and uh, with what everything is is happening at at Rovio? 
Um, you can follow me on Twitter. Um, it's, uh, I suppose you can tweet that for me, but uh, it's a Swedish word, uh, Pottan. Uh, it's spelled P-O-T-T-A-N. Um, yeah, that's probably the best way to reach me. Perfect. On Twitter. Yeah, we'll make sure that, uh, you know, when this gets posted, we'll post it so everyone watching can, can jump on and follow you, and um, you can thank us when you have 1.3 million followers, okay? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, again, Patrick, that's all I had, Rich. I, I think you covered everything. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Okay. That was a great interview. Thank you so much, Patrick. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Uh, catch up with you again, Spiro. Absolutely, yeah. We um, look forward to it, and, and uh, thanks again for your time, and we really, really appreciate you spending your evening with us. So thanks, Patrick. Thank you. Have a nice day. Okay, see you later. Yeah. Bye, Bye, -bye. Patrick. Bye.